you talked about encounter as a great entry point into a conversation about the work that you're doing now. It was really cool. The school was really interesting because we were constantly making things and like you would dance and then draw and then, and they call that inter, like intermodal transfer and intermodal dis, decentering. So you're moving from medium to medium where you have different resources and different strengths. Well, I really want to explore the method of expressive arts therapy that I've been learning at school, at the European Graduate School. And I want to talk about what happens and what has been happening for me over the last 10 months in the encounter, you know, and what, what that's been like, what, it, what it's felt like, what I've learned, um, what I still don't understand. What is, how, what is therapy? What is the value of a therapeutic um, intervention in my experience of social justice movements? Are we going to make like a collage? Yes. Uh, because now you're in the world of the art taking things out of time context and blending them together yeah, because now you're in the world of the art like we're always kind of encountering the world and encountering the object world around us and the people around us and our own memories of ourselves and we're, that we're always in this state but i think what makes it's like every event you know um is an encounter and and there's always these intense there's different intensities of the, those kinds of encounters which is some of what like um, this writer Brian Massumi is writing about is like this question of intensity, and so some things will really, you know, when you encounter, um, let's say if I encounter this candle and I burn it, like it has a, a certain something happens to it, and something happens to me, and the intensity is kind of different. Like I kind of get a scent in the world, and this quite miraculous at. Uh, experience of light, you know, and of, of fire in this contained way that's got an incredible history of, of the object. Of, like what, you know, you see, if you look at a candle for long enough, what is this candle? And who made the first candle? And how does the wax keep the wick from burning down? And it's quite, you can spend a lot of time thinking about a candle. But for the candle, uh, of course, the encounter is much more dramatic because it's combusting disappearing it's transforming at a physical level and it's, its entity is changing into another entity altogether so there's like this differential of intensity between us and while i am interested in the candle and can be inspired by it it doesn't it doesn't change me it doesn't change my my essential being whereas the candle once it's burned down its essence is gone it's no longer a candle um and that happens in in a lot of different kinds of encounters so one of the things we're thinking about like is what are what is this difference in intensity and how is it change is it changing the essence is it creating new possibility is it composing new co possibilities or is it um uh is in the encounter does it limit possibility um and are you know how do we account for the difference in intensity because I think if you, if you do a psychological approach to a movement, it's problematic because the movement is going towards the unknown and the psychological almost like requires the known. Right. It's talking about the known, but I like this aesthetic approach because it actually doesn't engage with a kind of pre-established future healing place that you want to get to. It's going to be better if you get like this because that you can't do that in activist work. You can't be like, well, I want you to be more, stable right you know it's not appropriate to in, to impose like where the where the future utopia is positioned right but here now you have like this possibility of doing healing without that which is really it's healing that's not focused on the future healthy state but it's focused on the moment mm -hmm. but it still has a healing it's still in terms of healing it still it still helps the person access more resources and so many activists that I know are under resourced internally. Yeah. Mostly because they don't the they're not being fed by the systems they live in because the systems are specifically working against their change. 
you know, by, by its very nature. So the question like then I want to be like, well, what can we put in place or what offerings can be made that doesn't just doesn't stop that person in their work and to put them into a tailspin around their trauma or their, or things in their past, but allows them to keep on working. And it's still, but it isn't only focused on empowerment, which then also is like, well, then just compartmentalize the past and ignore it. Right. It allows you in the moment to say, let's decenter for a second. So we're talking about like how you decenter the problem and put the art maker there. So you're like, I'm a person with a problem. That's who I am. And what we want to do is like disturb that so that that I, so you're not just like at the identity. That's not the only identity. So now you're like, I'm the artist with a different set of problems, which is the fact that I, I, I want orange and I've only got red and yellow, <laughs> you know, like, and so that and now I'm going to work on that problem. I've decentered my other problem right. and my identity as a problem haver. And now I'm like re- problem resolver creator. Mm-hmm. And so this, this, this is a, it's a way of like taking the same risks that you would need to take to resolve your original problem in which you're quite stuck, which is probably why you've come to the therapist or the therapist is in your life. And then you've decentered and now you work, you're working through a different problem, but now you're going to take those resources right back. But the one thing that is super interesting to me in this method, that's different than like music therapy or dance therapy or something like that is that it's inter arts, it's intermodal. So you're moving from one mode to another. And that I find super interesting because of how it relates to the world. Yes. So instead of like being like, I hear, you know, I know the world by hearing, I'm a music therapist. It's like, instead you have this very holistic way of um, working with learning styles so that you can work in what you're comfortable with. Um, But you can also work in what you're uncomfortable with where there's going to be so much other resources for you. Right. And those are probably resources that you don't touch very often in your life. Yes. If you're like, I don't paint. Well, then what else? What about your visual sense has not been activated? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and how much might you need that? So the high sensitivity comes in, especially when you couple it with low skill, low skill, high sensitivity. Then we're like, everybody knows that the matter in the room is vibrating at the frequency of trauma or conflict. Whether they have language for it or not, they know it. Yes. And so becoming sensitive to it is becoming, it's going closer to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you see, I have this big question inside of art therapy and social justice and what, what really is possible. Listen, each of the art forms as a kind of essential magic. It has a mode. And in that mode, certain things are possible. So certain things are possible when you sing. Yes. And when you sing together, and when you sing past your point, and when you scream, and the voice gives you some, some thing, because if you're only focused on the senses, then the voice will give you X. And then, um, and then there are things that cross, right? So rhythm, rhythm crosses across the modes. Mm-hmm. Light crosses across the modes. And so that, that's, that becomes super interesting. Yeah. But, but then if you have drawing, of course, other things are possible. So then if the client is comfortable expressing in this way, let's say they will, they're will they only going to talk. Mm-hmm. Talk is, that's a mode. So how, what if we transfer that? Then they take some resources, but they also find new ones. Mm. Some of their old resources won't work. And so they have to like, and, and what they do in this process, in this practice is, you know, you make the art and then you come back to ordinary time. Okay. You make the art, you talk about it, you talk about its surface, and then you come back to ordinary time and you say, well, let's talk about your problem again. So the whole, the only thing the therapist does is be like, so tell me about your problem. Okay, let's go to my studio, make something, come back and then say, so tell me about your problem. Did you learn anything about your resources? And you're like, yeah, I learned that I can hold a note for a long time. Mm-hmm. And you're like, and that, and it's sort of like, did that surprise you? I'm like, yeah, that really surprised me. I never tried to hold a note for so long. Ah. So what's the, what is, what is it that you use? What inner resources did you use to be able to hold that note for so long? It's like, well, I was willing to try, but I also like, I pushed past the part where I was uncomfortable. Oh, what did you do to do 
to, I, I just had to have a kind of faith. I had to tell myself I wasn't going to die. Even if I faint, I'm not going to die. Oh, great. Well, how does that apply to your problem? And they're like, oh, <laughs> you know, almost regardless of what your problem was. <laughs> then you have this new resource that you've discovered inside of yourself. Yeah. And let's make something. And then let's look at the making of that and then just bring it back mm -hmm. to where you are now instead of a, a yeah, like I say, a problematic around this, um, the, 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 the utopia, the aspect of where is the future. Right. And that your healer would have to be utterly enrolled in your activism in order to work with you towards that. And even so, would, and if they were, they wouldn't be able to work with you in the present. So you see how it's like almost impossible for psychology to manage the kind of trauma that comes from activism. Right. In particular. I, I'm just curious as to how, because I feel like, I feel like both social justice and art therapy are looking to open these spaces to be able to understand this collective, who are we? Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know, I love bringing them together to be able to see how each way of knowing and being can support each other. In you know, that's, that's very, I think this is something that in terms of lenses and, and awarenesses, I think this is something that I didn't talk about on the top, which is something that I want to, which is the, the importance of um, a conversation about power and justice and, 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 and systems of power that are built into um, therapy. Right. And so this, again, like I'm excited about expressive arts therapy as, as an, even a suggestion to bring it anywhere near, a, a, you know, because it does decentralize the power of the therapist. Like you don't, you're not there, you're not the expert who goes there to heal the person. You just come into my studio, let's make something, let me ask you about it, tell me about it. And then whatever you did, can you apply it to your problem? And for me, that, that, that's really been missing like in my experience of therapy and my and my um experience of um the, the sort of mental health industry and the and my outsider experience of like um working in detention youth detention as well of just really seeing how there's no agency like how agency is stripped away You know, in the decentering, there's the reality of what activists experience, and then you're decentering and going into an artistic space to be able to sense into an expression of something that may then that then we come and bring it back. How does that relate? Like, I think what's important is that you like. Let's say I was working on the issue of salmon farming in BC then I put so much of my energy and like this main thing that's always with me is these salmon. Like I'm thinking about this image. It's with me all the time. It causes me pain. It causes me to lose sleep. It, all of my relationships are related to it. It's my every day. It's what I think and breathe constantly. So what's important is that when we move to this space, this is not a space to express the salmon. And that I think is very difficult for activists to do. Yeah. To yeah. just actually have a break. Yeah. But you need that moment. And if, you, and if it's contained to an hour and it's clear about what you're doing, it can be a lot easier than to just try to be like, now I'm gonna go watch a movie. Now I'm gonna go watch a movie. Now I'm gonna go watch a movie. Like you can't really, it's very difficult to do that. But if you can go into this contained intentional thing and say okay what's your problem the problem i'm having is that i cannot communicate with the minister of fisheries i feel that we can't communicate because i am on the opposite side of them um and you say okay then let's go in here and why don't we just hum let's just start by humming and you're like i don't sing i don't sing I said, okay well humming is difficult for let's let's not let's let's go even one 
step back. What about just blowing? Okay, now if you put your lips together. Okay, let's just do that for a while. And you know, and so there's no salmon anywhere. Yeah. There's no, there's no potential of that. But just that moment where you went from, you agreed to do the blowing and it led you to the humming. Yeah. There was a personal inner resource that came out there. Yeah. So you're going to go through the whole hour. By the time you're done the hour, you've made a song, you've danced the song, you've painted the song, you've traced each other. Who knows what's happened in that space, right? All kinds of things can have happened. But you come back and then you're like, so remember the beginning? Why would you blow, but you wouldn't hum? What was going on for you there? Just go back to that moment and tell me about that moment. I would love to know what happened for you. And that person is like, well, I'm already blowing. I'm already breathing, so it was nothing. And then you, okay, well, is there any way that that relates to your issue that you came in here with? You know, and they might say, yeah, or they might say, no, no, I don't know. You know, that that's fine too, because you have tons of things that have happened in that hour. But you're, you have, I think in the case of the activists, you have two things going on. One, you can start to see things from angles you were not thinking. Yes. You start to realize you have resources you were not aware of and, uh, and capacities that can be grown. Two, you are learning to relate in a way that's not antagonistic. Yeah. Not, it may not, you may not need to learn that, but you're practicing relating in a non-antagonistic way. Mm -hmm. And three, regardless of the first two, you're getting an hour of refuge from the thing. Where you're still in the world, you're working with worlding, you're making, yeah. but you're not making that thing just for one hour. And you just, that alone, I think, um, can be quite healing. Yeah, that decentering, I think, is incredibly important in particular for activists because there's such identification, like the core identity is identified with doing the work. And staying in center, staying centered there. Yes. Yeah, never getting off that center. Yes. And, you know, it can become an extreme, as we both know, from our own lives, where I, I bring everything back to my issue. Yes. You know, I'm, I could be sitting around drinking a glass of juice, and I'm like, well, this juice not a feminist juice <laughs> you know <laughs> and, then, and i'm right i'm not wrong yeah you know and it's important but it's exhausting yeah. because there is nothing in the world that's truly a feminist thing so i'm all exhausted. yes it's, and I, I like the idea of the therapist coming beside you and being able to which is again what a facilitator is able to do that a teacher is in this to see the world from your point of view and just act as an ally but not a political ally but an ally in auto creation of the world. They're, just, they're my ally in the fact that breath by breath, I make the world I live in. And they're, they're just with me in that. Rather than being with me in my politic or with me in my family or with, you know, with me with a condition. Yes. And with other kinds of therapy, the condition is healing. Right. And, but here you don't have that. The condition is making what you're already already doing. Yes. And so I really like that. Um, I'm excited to explore that. In this method that I've been learning, um, expressive arts therapy, there's, um, there's a very interesting phrase that I came across that Stephen Levine used. He called it image abuse. And what I understand from it is that image abuse is kind of when you instrumentalize the image. You take that image or the object and you make it mean something or you make it. So you're like, okay, so you made this, this character out of, you made this sculpture. So this is probably your guy that you met earlier today. And so how do you, what do you want to say to him? Right. But in that I've, I've, I've stripped the, Im I've, I've made the image of given it a function, a pathological function that it might not even have. But instead, if I go close to the image and I'm like more aesthetic about it, I'm more sensual. I'm like, so tell me about this sculpture. I noticed that it's smooth. You've carefully smoothed the coat and the, and the, um, and the pants. What was that like for you? And I was like, well, it, when it was rough, it was really bothering me. It was just, I don't know why it just bothered. Oh yeah. And so when you did it, what did you, what was the process of smoothing it? Well, I 
you know, it was really felt good actually to, to get in there and just smooth out all those wrinkles, but you didn't do it for the face. No, I didn't feel I needed to do it for the face. It was like the clothes were a bit different. I wanted the clothes to have this effect. So we're not, nothing is being imposed on the image here. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, well, do you like your clothes ironed? Well, that must be a, something about your, uh, you know, you're very compulsive about your, you know, you must be very worried about your, uh, the way people see you. It must be a class thing. Do you have problems from that? You know, like you can abuse the image by making it mean things, or you can get close to the image and become intimate with it and learn as much as you can about the creation of it and, and its effect. And it's like, I noticed that you chose the clay that had been out a little longer. It's a bit darker. Did you do that on purpose? And I was a little bit more attracted to it. I don't know why. It felt like it had been, it's got full of energy. You know what I, you know, like this is the conversation that you're in. And you're really appreciating that creation for what it is. Mm -hmm. And you're honoring the sacredness of it. And you allow it to have both. It can have pathologies. It can have the sublime. It can be, and this is what I was reading in, in Stephen's article. Steve Levine's article is like, we're not, we're not looking for the object to do psychological work. We're looking for the object to intervene between us and the world. Right. And to create that space of, of a, well, intervene, but link also. Yeah. You know, this, this idea that you can't get out of your own image making function, but you can make these images and then they sit in the world. And that allows us to kind of link to the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so then it becomes like more like now I'm exposing my imagination and I'm working on my imagination. And my imagination is my self creating and world creating function. So I'm maturing in my imagination mm -hmm. and that allows me to do things like have simultaneous truths or have really robust metaphors or have a vision, you know, all these kinds of things have a new idea, mm -hmm. just be more creative, right? These, this is like the function of an imagination that's really well, well honed. And so this is a very interesting kind of therapy where you're not healing the past. You're not in there to be like, what broke and let's fix it in a medical model. Yeah. Instead, which like, and again, Stephen was writing in this, this book. Um, what's it called? No, it's right here. It's called um, Poesis. No, I'll tell you. It's called. Here it is. Beautiful. Yeah, it's, a, it's great. And the language of psychology and the speech of the soul. And I, I'm very interested in this thing. Like he talks about how Freud would like, and Jung got, especially Freud got into this thing about the imagination and um, free association and, and dreaming and these kinds of things. But like always to, in, the goal was to inhibit the imagination. So you're fantasizing because something's wrong with you. So how can we get you to stop fantasizing and get into the real world? Right. Whereas he starts to talk about, um, D.W. Winnicott and these others, like later psychologists after Young, and they're they be an education and and educators too, and they get into well, you're always going to be imagining. How can you come into relationship with your imagination? How do you come into relationship with your fantasies? How do you come into relationship with desire? Yeah, um, and that to me is super super interesting because then the therapist doesn't have the role of fixer or doctor. They have the role of co-creator. And so you, that, and I can see that being like something that really works in a social movement because there's no room for the like systematic authorities to come into these movements and be like, this is unhealthy. This needs to be fixed. This, you can't do this. Like that's even how anti-oppression tends to work. And it doesn't really work. Like anti-oppression in a way is kind of like hinged on a medical model of a, there's a pathology and it needs to be fixed. Right. Through talk therapy, essentially. Yeah. Or, or shock, depending on how, who's doing it. But this is more like, how do we extend the play space? Yes. It's one way that Paulo, Paulo Canillo talks about it. It's like, how do you expand your range of play? Which means expanding your imagination, which means like including, and then you get into this, these questions about, oh, well, how can I then walk a middle road? How can I take care of my health and my community at the same time? Mm -hmm. 
what would that be? Where, what are my resources? What are our, what are our relationships and how can they be um, sustaining? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so it's like image abuse and it's versus your aesthetic responsibility. Right. And your responsibility is both is like um, to be faithful to the image, but it's also to be able to respond to the image. And so the therapist's training in this work, it seems to me, would be to train them to be more sensitive to images, right. more subtle in their noticing, more. And so then you don't have to interpret, but you are, you deepen the image with every insight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, it's not that the image stays on the, they say the depth is on the surface. And what I get from that is like, you go to the surface and from there it has a root. Right. So it's not that it's disconnected from your consciousness or your psychology or your history. It's that you don't make the image. Um, a slave, a servant to that. And what, one thing I've been thinking a lot about has been how movement building and, and social justice movements are very much like in a duality mm -hmm. of being like, this is, this is what's wrong and therefore this is what we need to do. And then this is the person who's wrong and this is what we need to tell them. And this is how we like create this double dialectic, like this, these things that are in tension with each other. And then like, align ourselves with the camp and then like try to keep pulling people over to this camp and containing the influences of this camp. And the more like, like protests and the, like, you know, and they're very, it's very important. Like what we're, what we're seeing at, in the Kinder Morgan pipeline, like it's very important to like vocally establish that resistance. Yes. Where, what I'm interested in is like, instead of getting into this, push and pull about who's more right and who has the moral high ground being um, curious about when these two things are simultaneous, what is another option? Like what else exists? And that I think could be a therapeutic relationship, mm -hmm. not a conflict resolution or even conflict transformation. Cause you might be doing that with conflict transformation being like, okay, well, here's our two parties. In order to get to yes, we're going to try to find a new solution that we not haven't thought of yet. So there's that. But again, then the therapeutic is again like, like if the conflict transformation was about healing, you know, what would that look like? Yeah, and you talked at the beginning about this, this, um, this. There's the self and the object, and then this third thing. Right? Yes. Yeah. And it, it's this, it's this third thing that for me has a certain kind of magic. And I'd love to hear you kind of talk into that emergent third thing. Paolo Canil talks about it in a wonderful way, but everybody's always talking about this third, uh, one way or another mm -hmm. is this, this thing. So for me, the third is, um, It's that place, like, because you have the third between the people, the therapist and the person, but you also have the third between you and the art piece itself. So the art can be the third between the people, and then between you and the art, there's a third. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then between those thirds, there's, you imagine. And so for me, there's this harmonic that you're talking about, this um, fragrance that comes from relating and encountering. Yeah. It's unpredictable. Come is is interdimensional. Yes. Is um, somehow also. I don't know what you think about this, but I have the instinct that it's also um, good. Like the emergent third. I don't know. Like I, I think I feel like when things are happening that are not good, like. Harm, where harm is being done, there isn't a third. Right. Yeah. That's what's missing, mm -hmm. is that feeling of communion. 
um, I don't know, that's something that I would think about more. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but that's what I think. But I, then I guess actually now, even as I say it, I realize I can be quite wrong about that because there is a third in, in the evil encounter as well. Any encounter is going to give you a third. Yeah. But yeah, the third is, this is it's not the combination right. of the two. It's the surprise yeah. of the combination. Yes. What didn't exist before, but was tacitly present already. Yes. And somehow is part of the magnetism. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's completely unknown. And it cannot be known. And then once it becomes known, it, it ceases to be that third. Like it, it's only in that moment of, of it appearing. And that's why I was like, oh, it's always a good, even though now I realize it's, and I'm glad I said it out loud because it's not always a good, but it is always a surprise. It's always new. Therefore, it's always connected to wonder. Yes. That can seem like a good. And that newness that you're, that you're bringing in, that's really a special part of what this is. Yeah. You know, like you just said, you know, once it becomes known, it's only that it is unknown that, it holds enough to yeah it's new yeah. Yeah. yeah so if we think about colonization there is an a mo there is an encounter and a third and there's a potential for something truly new but the he hegemonic Im impact yeah tilts that right where you don't have an encounter any longer one is protecting itself from being affected. Yes. Only one is affected. Right. Hmm. Which comes back to this question of teaching and leadership and yes. policy, and, you know, vulnerability and transparency. Yeah. And being affected. That there's no, that's what Masumi is saying in this book, Politics of Affect, is like, you're not, it's not an encounter unless you are affected and affecting. Mm -hmm. And that does take that vulnerability and, you know, that creative risk. I'm not ready to hum, but I'm ready to blow. Mm -hmm. and, and then on the other side, to think of it, right? Instead of being like, well, hum, it's easy. Mm -hmm. We'll just do it. Yeah. You know, you're not... You're actually not in an encounter. You're in a kind of aggressing. But if you say no, and I'm like, okay. And then I'm like, what about this? And you say, okay. And we're kind of affecting each other and allowing my, my initial position to change. As the third emerges, as the newness enters. Because then once you blow, then you hum. Then you, you know, and, and so we're, our wills are becoming entangled. And I think that gets lost in politics. Yeah. Okay, so we think about the candle, we think about the object, we think about different people that we encounter in different ways. And then you start to think about like power and encounter and how, um, how certain intensities can be, for example, invisible to us. Right. So I could have an intense effect on someone and not actually really realize it. I'm not aware of the various intersections and uh, implications of my presence or vice versa. So I, I'm curious about the space of art therapy and social justice and where that all sits as well in, in terms of encounter and relationship. Well, in terms of the art therapy, especially this EXA expressive arts therapy that I'm learning at the uh, European graduate school, it's like the thing itself, you know, so it's like a lot of the encounter, like I encounter the therapist, yes, but the therapist and I encounter the art and between my encounter with the art, something arises, a third thing. thing. And so you keep coming back to the thing and the thingliness of it. A therapist encounter and the object, a third thing arises. And now we're like in conversation about like, what is cost, what are these possibilities? What are these new compositions? Now you're in a whole other field. Yes. So the art object is affecting me in one way and them in one way, and it's changing our relationship as well. So you have this whole new um, world, actually. You're building a world, and you're ending up in that world together. 
and then you're able to talk into, like we were talking about last time, the aesthetics of that object as aspects of that encounter. Right. How do those aesthetics impact you? And also, how are you making choices as to how those, like, um, is the smooth clay affecting you more than if you left it rough? Or is it, how, how is it affecting What does it do for you? Or how do you experience it? How did you make that choice? How did you come to make that choice? All those things have, like, implications in the relationship, in the encounter with the art object and with the therapist. But then you also have, like... Um, The self-reflection on the re, uh, on the ways that you did the encounter, right. which gives you information as to how you encounter the world, right. and that uh, is what you're applying to your problem. Mm. So that in this case, like where you really don't focus on psychology, focus on aesthetics. Your aesthetic choices really remind you of how you create the world you live in, because right. you're sort of. The way I treat the paper maybe has a correlation, maybe has a correlation to the way I um, clean my stove, which may have something to do with the way I treat, I learned to treat my home, which may have something to do with my relationships with my family, you know, so that I might be learning about myself in my ways of encountering. There's this writer who lives here in Montreal, Brian Masumi, and he writes about encounter. And he writes about affect and feeling and feelings like the feeling, the sense of feeling and intensities and qualities of feeling um, emotion, but like also other feeling like sensation. And for him, encounter is like the ability to affect and be affected. Right. To affect and be affected. And I think a lot in, in our movements, actually that's not present. Like you're really blocking yeah. the other. Mm-hmm. And in that, don't have access to the whole picture because the, that other is holding like half of the picture of what is in the moment. And so, the, you know, for me, a lot of the question with the social justice work and in having an, an, an encounter with the other um, would, is like the question is like, the, otherwise the end has already been predicted. And sometimes the end is quite grisly. Like you if you take sometimes what's being said about um, a certain group, let's say white supremacists, what's being said is that they don't like, if you really take the rhetoric to its end, it's like they should all die. Hmm. They're not transformable. They're not redeemable. They're not re- they can't be rehabilitated and they can't be in these spaces and they can't be allowed to get any worse and they can't be allowed to really gather and like, internalize their aggression so it kind of is like well then is is the plan to exterminate these white supremacists and i think there is a feeling feeling part of me that unexamined might be saying that right but examined with my conscious mind and i'm like of course that 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 is just a recreation of the of the horror that we're talking about and that and that gives rise to the feeling of wanting to kill somebody else Right. On a moral principle, on a on an ethical level, on according to a moral principle, and so, and that's an extreme example. But I need it, like sometimes for me to be able to picture these things, I need this extreme example because then you're like, well, what about a rapist? Yeah, do they should they all die? Is that the only way? And if there if it's not the only way, then the question then becomes, how does the change happen? Mm-hmm. And we have to be careful with that so that that doesn't become a question of the victim having to rehabilitate the aggressor. Yeah. Which in the restorative justice world is very, is handled in a very interesting way. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm also interested in how it can be handled through art therapy in movements. Right. Because I think what could be possible is that you can encounter that other without having to encounter them. Sort of taking into account like our creativity as our way of making time, as our way of making moments. So like constantly creating a moment, then you have this therapist character. So now you're creating a moment, but it's enclosed in a session. So it has a whole bunch of other safety in it. You're, it's private, it's confidential. 
And then here is the other that you've created. And then later we're talking about like, well, how did you make it? Yes. And then let's say I say, you know, like I, I changed my mind. I was able to see that like, I didn't need a tall one. I could make a small one and I would be just as happy with it still represented what I wanted. And I'm actually quite happy with the small one because I was able to put more detail in it. And then the therapist might say, so how does that relate to your problem that you had this afternoon when you encountered the white supremacist? And then I think through that and I'm like, okay, well, um, I wanted him to fully understand my point of view. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't happy until he could see that he was completely wrong. But now in this, I might even have been happy with less. Maybe I would have been happy with an apology with, it, with him, like actually just noticing that he hurt my feelings and not having to fully understand why and not me being not the person to tell him fully why, you know, but like just to have him acknowledge that something happened and maybe I would have been fine with that. And we could have actually gone somewhere more, more interesting from there. Mm -hmm. So I'm learning about new resources mm -hmm. that I have based on how I, because it's all creativity. If you're like, I'm always making up the moment and creating, then this moment of creativity is exposing resources that I still have access to in my real life or yes. whatever, you know, not my non session life. And that, that's what I'm interested in is like, what's the place for that kind of healing to happen so that when I do encounter that person, I have, I'm way more resourced. Yeah. And this it's not a, actually not a judgment about whether that person needs to be exterminated or or put in jail you know or or have have things happen to them that's not actually even what i'm thinking about but i'm thinking more about like although that's my starting place for thinking about it i needed that starting place because i was like i don't think this is the end game that we're really thinking of like we're this isn't the vision for change but it, then when i encounter my client I'm not trying to say to this client now, I want what I want for you is for you to be able to be a best friend of a white supremacist. Yeah. Right. I'm just using it as a starting place to, to make me ask, where is the therapeutic impulse in the social justice movement? But with the client, what I want is for them to feel um, more highly resourced, more creative, have more possibilities in these encounters, be able to keep themselves more safe and that the, and that it's all present moment so that whatever the projection is of the future is that it's allowed to unfold and that it's not a certain movement or a certain party or something that's holding the vision for the future because of what we've seen in Canada with Justin Trudeau, you know, like to lock in the future of this country as like a reconciliation slash end game project in, and then, to, and then to say, well, then we all have to position all our movements around that. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of being like, well, what we have here is the moment, but the next moment isn't known yet. And so we can encounter, we can come into a state of encounter, which is the state of the unknown third. It's the middle in the sense of like, what is emergent? Yes. You know, so when you encounter yourself as an other, so if I encounter myself, like with all of my drawings, like something's external and all of your paintings and something is externalized and now it's an other. Yes. And now you can come into, into an encounter with it, which you couldn't do when you were just by yourself. And from that is this third. And this third thing is the unknown. And so if I'm stuck in a problem, I need a way to get to the unknown, to the new. And so this is like this, it's this encounter with the witness of the therapist maybe. Yeah. And then you have this third. It's, you don't have to be skillful. You have to be sensitive. Mm. And what you have to be sensitive to is the material. Mm. So if you're going to be dancing, then you get sensitive to pressure. You get sensitive to gliding versus hopping. Right. But, you know, you get into it. And the more you get into your material, um, the more depth. So that's why depth is on the surface. It's like it's, in, it's all in the material. And they're focusing on the aesthetics, the senses. What do you see? What do you feel? Like you're really with it in that you're not, you're not in, you're not doing a process in order to do something else. Right. And that was really, so the art itself took a center. Mm. Uh, and the person is decentered. 
through the art making process and is able to, in a way, like leave the normal and go into the extraordinary. What's also interesting to me is the, is the orientation to the self and the spaces between, you know, mm -hmm. the, the art object is expressing the spaces between and out picturing something in, in a way that allows that space to be able to see the self and how one shows up in the different ways. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think one of the things that's really interesting about that is that in terms of what you, the word, I think that's an interesting word you use, out picture, because you, what you don't do in this practice is you don't make art about the problem. So you're not making a thing to express the, the problem itself. So like the painting that you just showed me, you're working something out through an artistic process. So in this, which is, I mean, which of course we both do a lot of, is like journaling and yes. so helpful. Um, but here what we try to do is decenter. So we're trying to make another piece of art and really get into what that high sensitivity that's talking about and sensitivity, so low scale, high sensitivity, sensitivity to the material and make from that place. So I'm not like how, you know, I have, I'm having a problem relating to the family member. Now I'm gonna make a model of the family member and a model of myself, which is a kind of like how play therapy sometimes works. Right. Um, and other kinds of art, other methods of art therapy. Mm -hmm. But here I'm, in, I'm not actually, I'll tell you that I'm having a problem relating to a family member. And then you're like, okay, let's go into the art studio, the therapist, let's go into the art studio. And then you're like, I have these, this stack of leather circles. What do you think of them? And I'm like, I, I, they're interesting. These are interesting. Where did these come from? You know, and then, and, you know, and you're like, well, what do you, what, what, what do they remind you of? Or where do you, what do you feel about them? And I'm like, oh, it's really interesting how they're smooth on one side, but on the other side, they're rough. You know, and they're water stained, they look old. And some of them are, are stained in different, and they're not all the same size. In this thing. And so you keep coming back to the thing and the thingliness of it. Yeah. And if I'm getting to know, I'm starting to learn about this, these, these things, just by sensing them. Like, oh, they all have, they, they all have different pictures. Then I look again, I'm like, oh, they're not all different. There's a, there are some that are different and some that are the same. And then the art therapist me like, well, is there anything you want to do with those? I'm like, well, I, I kind of want to stack them in order of their size. So I might stack them. You know, and so I'm kind of playing. And I'm like, oh, it seems like there were two sizes that were cut. So there's, like, there's just, there's two different, they're just two different sizes. Whereas I had thought that they were all probably different. And then you're like, well, is there anything you want to add to that, maybe? Or do with that? And then I'm like, no, not really. I'm not really that interested in that. And so then our therapist might be like, well, is there, um, and maybe, maybe instead of making something with them, we want to talk about them. Maybe we want to write, can we write about them? And I'm like, yeah, actually I kind of would write, I would, I would like to talk and write about the cartoonness of this. Cartoonness, like this is interesting because they seem similar and they seem, but when you group them, you suddenly see that there's this category. And so anyway, so then we get into this thing, we write this poem. And we just keep following the material. Mm -hmm. So our therapist is really coaching me into making something. They're being like, well, what do you like? Well, you want to trace it? I'm like, yeah, I'd love to trace them. So they give me a nice, big, thick piece of paper and a big black marker, and I start tracing these circles. So it's, and it's like, well, how does it feel when you trace those circles? Well, I really like it, but I don't like that I'm leaving a black edge on this. Also, it bothers you to leave that black edge. You want to try a pencil and say, yeah, yeah, I'd rather use a pencil. So we just go, we're just in the materials. We're not thinking about, because you know, my analytic, my psychological mind is already going like, wait a second, she likes the two. Image abuse. She wants to talk about relationship. Called it image abuse. She wants yeah. to talk about the difference. And so I could have left on that, right? right? Or she doesn't like to mark something and stain it. She's really careful with things. So I might want to like jump on that, but I want to hold back on all of that and just keep following the piece and the instinct the aesthetic instinct that the person has, because that's their, that's where you leave them their agency. Right. That's where you find out who they are as a creator, which is the creative life. Like they're exploring themselves as that creator. 
And then eventually, let's say an hour passes, now I've got this big paper covered in circles with poems in every one of the circles. And I love it. I'm like, my God, I made this thing. It's like all these Venn diagrams and I, I love it and I'm so proud of it. And you're, you also like it and you're like, wow, when I see this, you're the therapist, so you're like, when I see this, um, it really makes me want to dance. Do you want to do a dance for you? That, that looks like this. And I would be like, of course you can do a dance for you, right? So then you do this circle dance. Yeah. It's an intertwining circle dance. And you're like, do you want to try this circle dance with me? Maybe, you know, and we're like dancing with the circle dance. And then we're like, okay, you are retired, And now we're laughing and we're like, okay, let's go back into my office. We leave the studio. We go to the office. And it's interesting because he talks, Paulo Cano, when we were at school, talks about delineating and even in your workspace, mm. the, the play area, the art studio and the therapist space, which can even be as small as just a table but that it's a different world. So you enter extraordinary time and then you leave extraordinary time, but you leave kind of changed. And so while we were there in the extraordinary time in the art space, we would be like really talking about like, wow, the thick circle. Well, the cost of the thick circle was that I stained the leather circles, but I love them. I really, at the end of the day, even though I stained it, I like it better. Yeah, what do you like better? Well, it just has this density. Whereas the pencil circles, they're thin, they're weak, and they don't, they don't give me the same effect. I don't feel like writing poems in them as much going on. So we're really, we're doing an aesthetic analysis. But just, do you see how we haven't left? Yes. Into, um, into uh, image abuse. Like a kind of meaning making? Yes. If we're not looking, well, that is this which is something that we do a lot in positive psychology, for example, or in um, experiential education. Yeah. And, and that's as a result of the decentering. So it's not about the thing. Yeah. It's and not about the issue. It's just about making a thing. We're just like, and we can sing, we can make the, the dance, the circles, just the touching of the leather circle. It's all about the senses and getting more and more sensitive to the material, which is to become more and more sensitive to the material world. Yes. More sensitive to your world and extend your range of play within that world. So you're just, and so then you go back to the therapeutic space and you say, okay, now do we remember what was it you came in here to talk to me about? And I say, yeah, I was having a problem relating to my family member. Yeah. So is there anything that you learned or, or, or that reminds you of that issue from what we did in the theater, in the studio? And then you might be like, yeah. And this is where the thick line, I just want them to speak directly to me. Right. But I know it's going to, you know, when it stains the thing, I know it's going to hurt. Yeah. But actually in the end, I prefer it. Right. And you're like, oh, okay, so what would you maybe be willing to try? You know, and, it, and that's it. So you're just, as a therapist, it's like zero intervention. You're just playing with the person. But then you're helping to remind them. So you're like, oh yeah, I remember how you first, the first thing you did was separate those. What was up with that? Right. You know, I'm like, oh yeah, well, I guess with our problems, some things are real problems that I do want to trace and some actually aren't. I want to be able to tell the difference. So it's not literal, but it's just helping them to connect to resources, internal resources. Right. You know, and preferences and taste and what do you want? What do you tend to want? And things like that. And there's something very powerful about taking it into the different modalities, you know, as you talked about the circle dance and then the dancing together and yes. hopping from, from modality to modality. Yeah, they call it intermodal transfer. Mm. I think it's very interesting, that aspect. Yes. Rather than like music therapy or drama therapy or something like that. Mm. Because obviously like the hand tracing has a different set of resources. Yes. Then the eye sorting. Right. It's doing, it's, it's like a different aspect of how I work in the world. Different parts of me come out. So when we talk about resources, there's, there's inner resources, there's the things that you're working with, and then there's capacities, capabilities, the, the, the therapists themselves and, and the resources that they might bring. Are there more? Hmm. That's an interesting question.
I think there is there is something that became clearer last year at school around the practice, the artist practice of the therapist that can bring a lot more resources. Like if you're comfortable with materials and you know about them and you know how you know how to help somebody sing or how to help, that goes along with it. That's a big resource, I think. I think there's the materials themselves. There's like value in not at the expense of the material necessarily, but the sensuality, like there's something so interesting about these leather circles. There's something so thoughtful and it has a, it's, it itself has a certain resource. Um, but I think a lot of what they're talking about are these inner resources. And being able to explore those and bring new ones out. I hadn't thought about it in that way, that there's resource like implicated in lots of different levels of this work. Mm -hmm. I really like that. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the other elements? Because it's a real constellation um, in terms of how this form works. We've talked about a number of them. So low scale, high sensitivity, art as the other, enlarging the play space. So that's like, if I only really think about, um, like if I'm like, first of all, if I'm like, I don't play music. I don't paint like Tamers back in 2006. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so you don't paint. So do you, can you put, do you put paint on things, you know? And then it's like, you're slowly enlarging. Right. right, right place. Right. What about two colors? What about two brushes? What if you touched it with your hand? Enlarging. And then intermodally that becomes dimensional. So then you're like, okay, so you painted that. So what if, what if we sang that? Yeah. How would that work? What if we danced that one line? Mm. So that's like enlarging the play space and then they have uh then we, we talked about depth is on the surface there's one that's nice which is called uh play is the opposite of game so they're not talking about games now that's also interesting because the pie we use a lot of games you know but here they're like no it doesn't have an end it doesn't have rules play doesn't have like not a game it's this open emergent phenomenon that's play and so that's one of their their principles whereas we'd be happy to mix play and game and make and be you know like it as um then there's the third the idea of the third um the idea that the therapy the therapeutic space has kind of like two sides and that even life has sort of these two sides one which is ordinary time and one which is extraordinary time and that's where the numinous kind of takes over and insight can really happen and mm -hmm wonder and creativity and joy. I think that's a lot of what I'm getting from this piece around high sensitivity too, is it's not just because the material, like, like if, you're, if your mode is singing, the material is the lungs, the larynx, the tongue, the teeth, right? And so at that point, suddenly this, the distinction between the art piece and the body collapses. Yeah. And then at that point, the distinction between the body and the room collapses. Yes. And the body and the social world around you. Yes. I, I think the thing that, that really draws me in is the, is the following the senses. Mm -hmm. Because you get to, you know, get out of your own way. And like you were saying, like, we're, we're such meaning-making machine to, to fall into a process and allow it to take us and have that guidance drawn out. But it's really space that's given. A whole new field of play. How this is all alchemical, because in the encounter with the other, that the third appears. So it's a way of really looking at beauty as a force of healing. So you would do something and then you would talk about it. What do you like about it? What is it? And describe it. And then you could do it again. Yes. You know, and that, that again, I think is a way of really honoring the product and honoring the artwork and the person making it to feel like an artist. Where does art therapy fit into the picture of social justice? Not like how do you do therapy on the people or groups? Right. But like, what is the value of that framework to movement building? Yes. I mean, to me, the question then becomes like, where, where are these, what is the kind of the phenomenological, the sense-based express, like, 
affective um, experience of social justice. And so what are we making? Yeah. Right? And so all of these relationships, all of these articulations, every time anyone writes a book and gives a lecture and does a demonstration and a protest, if those are seen as art objects, as aesthetic moments, um, then we start to get into like, what is the sense, the feeling sense of them? Yeah. And then I think we would see like some pretty interesting, I mean, not even to think about the future, but to say like, to me, the role of the arts in, in social change is to bring the body into the, into the question. Into, and, the, and to bring the whole question into the moment. Like, what are we now? Yes. Rather than like always a projective a future and a, and a kind of dissonance with the past. But it's say like, how are we interpenetrated and, si and simultaneous right now? Yes. What is emerging? Yes. And yeah. that I think is one aspect. And then the other aspect is, I guess, like, in, yeah, as opposed to being like against and for, where we are comparing and contrasting our who's got a better notion of the future and that that's where neoliberalism comes out of and the watcher what and mean? the decider like like that's like like who's watching who and who's deciding what's better and who's the more superior intellect and who's the you know who's the bad guy here yeah. instead of like what are what is emerging and how are we tending to it yeah i think that's the role of the arts and social change it's it's so, okay um, that's why this is a gem yeah uh, because now you're in the world of the art. Right. Mm -hmm.